Well, organic outreach is really just another way of saying natural evangelism. And it's uh, this concept that evangelism, is, as we tend to think of it, uh, where we're just meeting people and trying to introduce them to the gospel right away, is not the most effective way to do it. Uh, so it's really about building relationships. It's about engaging with people in their lives and walking alongside of them and demonstrating to them what who Jesus is through your own life and your experiences. I remember when my wife Jill and I first came to the Lord, we, uh, our church was very into evangelism and we were asked to go knock on doors, uh, tell people about Jesus down on the beaches and it was awkward for us. It was so uncomfortable. But when organic outreach came to my life some eight years ago, it changed my game. I, it's the greatest adventure I've ever been on and I wish I could tell a couple of the hundreds of stories, even some resulting in people coming to Christ. That's the difference with organic outreach is finding your natural way. And when it comes to keeping a church focused on essentially evangelism, um, the strategy that we use within our church and that we're training other churches in is just that accountability from the leadership down allows this to be an area that we continue to grow in, in our own personal spiritual walks, and also within the life of a church on a regular basis. And that makes it unique and exciting. Dan and Lori had some friends give them a call and say, hey, you want to go out to dinner? And they said, sure, we'd love to. And friends said, we want to take you to a restaurant you've never been to before. So they took them to this little Mediterranean place. And they loved it. The environment was warm. When it came time to order the food, you know, Dan's kind of particular. He says, you know, I, I'd like this, but could you not put that on it? Could I have a little bit extra of this? And could you put that on the side? And you always get different responses for that. But the, the server says, says, that's no problem. This is your kitchen, your place. However you want it, we'll serve it that way. And Dan said, I'm home. <laughs> and they, they had a great meal. And when they got the end of the meal, they said, would you like dessert? No, no, we're full, we're fine. And they brought them just a little sliver of baklava just to cleanse the palate, to kind of leave them with a sweet taste in their mouth. And, and, and after that, what do you think Dan and Lori did? They talked with people about this restaurant. You got, oh man, we went to this restaurant. The food was so good. The service was so warm and friendly. They, they, it was reasonably priced. They talked about it. And we don't think that's weird. We think that's normal because that's what you do when you go to a great restaurant that you really enjoy. You tell someone else. You might even invite them out to eat. Uh, Rosie. Uh, Rosie uh, had a friend say, you got to watch this new show. So she turned on the show. And she said, this new show is about this family. They've got these, these triplets, and tragically, they lose one of them at birth, but then they adopt another child, and it's this whole, all about, kind of, it goes back earlier in their lives and later in their lives, and it, there's character development. So she watched it, and, and Rose just loves this show. And, she, and, she's, and she's amazed because there's actually, like, nice characters in it. And so many shows these days don't have any. She's like, I love this. So she's, what does she do after she watches the show and enjoys it? She, she tells others, oh, there's this really neat show. Matter of fact, it's not even on cable. It's on regular TV. You have to wait a whole week till you see the next episode. You know, but she's, she's all excited. And we don't think she's weird. We think that's normal. That's what you do when you're excited about something. Howie walks into Costco for the first time and he falls in love. He just falls in love with Costco, and it's his new home, it's his new place, and, and he talks about it, and he shops it, because he likes to buy in bulk at a good price. So he becomes an evangelist for Costco. <laughs> and nobody thinks it's weird, because that's what you do. That's what people do when they're excited about something. Justin, Justin grew up outside the church, no faith. But he had some friends invite him to church. And he became a follower of Jesus. And his life changed. He felt love like he'd never felt loved before. He felt like he belonged like he'd never belonged before. Deep parts of his soul that had been broken and fragmented started being put back together by the love and the grace of God. He met Jesus face to face. His life was changed. What do you think he's going to do with that? Nothing. Not talking to anybody. Not sharing with anybody. He's keeping his mouth closed because he doesn't want to offend anybody. You say, really? Unfortunately, too often that's what happens. 
People encounter the living God. They come to the cross. They receive Jesus Christ. They fall in love with him. And they're they're passionate. They love Jesus. It's real. But they've got this idea, like Justin did, that if I talk about my faith, it's going to offend people. It's going to drive them away. They're going to think I'm being a hate monger because they've been buying into kind of what the world says about Christians. And so, so they're just, we're often so quiet. And here's the reality. The world is not offended by Christians who actually love Jesus, who are authentic, and who organically, naturally, just share their joy for Jesus. The world's offended by people who shove stuff down their throats, who are loud and obnoxious and not organic and natural. I'm absolutely convinced that if everyone who's part of Jesus' church all around the world, if we would be as excited about Jesus and talk about our love for Jesus just, now watch this, just half as much as our favorite sports team. Just half as much as our favorite show or restaurant. It would change the world. Imagine if we actually talked about Jesus twice as much as we do other things. One of the markers of spiritual growth for a Christian is what we call at Shoreline Church organic outreach. That's naturally, organically sharing about the love of Jesus. And every Christian who knows Jesus and loves Jesus ought to begin living that way, ought to begin sharing their faith because it is good news, it is amazing, and it's even better than free baklava at the end of a dinner. (laughs) It's even better than a really cool show on TV. Knowing Jesus can change our lives and change the world. When Jesus walked on this planet, God with us, Emmanuel, he lived a life with no sin and no wrong. He was put on a cross and killed, crucified for our wrongs. That's what we're going to celebrate this Friday on our Good Friday services. We're going to remember that Jesus laid his life down. He was buried for three days. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. Someone say amen. Amen. He rose again. We're going to celebrate that next Sunday, Easter Sunday. And and that, that Jesus rose from the dead. And before he went back to heaven... He appeared to his followers and he taught them and he spoke to them. And one of the very last things Jesus said is found right in the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, beginning in verse 18. We read these words. This is right before Jesus goes back to heaven. Then Jesus came to them, his disciples, his people, and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Therefore, you go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And I love this last part. Jesus says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You won't be alone when you do this. I'll be with you. Jesus says, one of the the last things he says is, listen, I want you to let the world know. But Jesus wants us to do it in a way that's natural, that's organic, but he wants us to reach out to people. So, as we've been talking in this series, we always ask the question, why? Why is this important? Why is this one of the seven markers of spiritual maturity? And again, all of these things are on the website. If you click and click on the notes, you can have all these. So don't try to write all this down. Just listen and and let God speak to your heart. Why? Why should we measure our outreach impact and seek to increase it? Why should we say, when it comes to reaching out naturally with God's love, I should actually want to do it more? More naturally, more often. Why? Well, here's a reason why. Because Jesus' last call should be our first priority. The last call of Jesus, the last words of Jesus should be our first priority because he gave the most important thing. It's like, don't forget this one. I know it's going to be scary. I know it's tough sometimes. I know your mouth gets dry and you get nervous. You think everyone's going to go crazy if you talk about Jesus. But he says, I want you to do this. I want you to live it out. So his last call should be our first priority. Why? Because people are lost without Jesus and need what only he can bring. The Bible teaches that people are lost. Luke chapter 15 tells these three beautiful stories of a lost coin, a lost sheep, and a lost son. And in each case, what you find out is lost things are worth looking for. And in the lost sheep story, I love the lost sheep story because here's a shepherd. He's got 100 sheep. And the shepherd could have played the numbers game when the one wandered off. Okay, one's gone, but I still got 99. I'm pretty good. 99 is pretty good out of 100, right? I mean, in any class, that's an A. 
But, he, but he's like, no, I got one sheep missing that's lost. What does a shepherd do? Goes and looks and finds the sheep. That's the heart of God. That's the God who sent my sister Gretchen looking for me. Who sent my friend Doug looking for me. Who sent Dan, the youth pastor of the church, looking for me. God sent people to look for me. And they naturally talked about their faith. And it drew me to Jesus. Now we become those folks that are out there on behalf of Jesus helping find lost sheep. That's part of our call. Why? Because we all have people we love, care about, and we want to meet Jesus. You have people in your life that don't yet know that God loves them. I've been a Christian for 40 years. There's almost not a day that's gone by in the last 40 years that I haven't prayed for my dad to know the love of Jesus. I love my dad, and I want him to know how much God loves him too. We have people we care about. Why? Because we want people to know that God loves them, that he's there for them. He can give them new life and forgiveness. That's exciting. Because deep in the soul of every Christian is a passion to share the good news that has changed our life. If you've come to the cross and you've received Jesus, there is something inside of you that actually wants to let other people know that God is there for them too, that wants to let people know that Jesus died and rose again and can change their life. There's something in you. I know that because if you come to the cross, the Holy Spirit lives in you. And so there's that desire. Why? Because we're made for this, even though it scares us and makes us nervous. And I think mostly it scares us because we have the wrong conception. We think, oh, I've got to go stand on some street corner on a box and start screaming at people about Jesus. And you're like, I don't want to do that. Can I tell you what? I'm a pastor. I don't want to do that either. I've never done that. I don't want to do that. Freaks people out. Freaks me out. (laughs) But what I do want to do is love people. And so do you. I do want to talk about Jesus with, with, with more enthusiasm than I talk about my favorite TV show or my favorite sports team. More naturally. Because he means more to me than any of those other things. So there's something in us that longs for that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the apostle Paul, great leader in the first century church, writes these words, just kind of gets down to the very very middle of it all. And he says this, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. He says, let me get down to it. Here's the deal. God came among us He lived, he died, buried three days, rose again. So that's the heart of it. We have a story to tell that changes lives. It's changed our life. It can change the lives of others. And then John 3, 16 and 17. You've heard this before, probably, maybe not, but you most likely have, but I want you to hear it one more time. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that's Jesus, that whoever... Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. There is saving power and hope and life in Jesus. And if we believe that, man, we should want to say, God, how can I share this simple story of your love and of your grace? Years ago, I wrote a book called Organic Outreach for Ordinary People. It's kind of everything I know about how to just naturally share the story of Jesus with other people. And in that book, I give a little story about a, a guy, who, an atheist, a guy named Penn Gillette, and Penn is an illusionist and an actor and kind of a, a voice for a lot of different causes. And Penn, uh, on his own kind of vlog, on his own video blog, he talks about somebody who tried to tell him about Jesus. Somebody who came up to him after a show and gave him a Bible and wanted to tell him about Jesus. And you expect him to say, and man, this guy really ticked me off because he's an atheist. And he says, and it was really beautiful. He says, matter of fact, I I think that Christians who really believe what they believe ought to do that. This is an atheist. And he goes on to say this. He says, says, you know, if you believe, this is an atheist talking. He says, if you believe there's really a heaven and glory and you can be with God, and there's really like a hell and you can be separate from God forever. He says, if you really believe that, here's what he says. How much do you have to hate someone to not tell them about it? I was like, so I'm an atheist. We love people. And Christians are filled with love for people, the love of God. Shouldn't that stir us to want to tell them about this great hope that's found in Jesus? So the what? We have to ask ourselves, well, what does that look like? How do I start to grow in this? The what? 
What can we measure to help us see if we're growing in our outreach passion and engagement, our organic outreach, naturally reaching out? And just here's some simple things you can kind of look and say, am I growing? Am I moving forward? How much we pray for those who are far from the Savior? Do you, do you pray for people that don't know Jesus? God, let their heart be open. Let them know your love. Lord, give me a natural way to talk about my faith. Do you pray about this whole outreach thing? God, open people's hearts and also, God, open my mouth and my life to share. Do you pray in a growing measure? The what? Our personal outreach temperature and passion for those who don't know God's amazing love. Is our love for people and our passion for people actually growing? Or do you like, oh, if there's someone's not a Christian, oh, I'm kind of irritated by them. No, that's not the heart of Jesus. Jesus loved people that were hostile towards him. He loved the people that nailed him to a cross. While they're nailing him to the cross, he says, Father, forgive them. So is my passion for people that don't know God's love decreasing or increasing? I use this little scale of zero to 10. You know, like a zero or a one is like icy cold, I don't care, I'm hard-hearted. And nine or 10 is like passionate, hot desire. I want people to know God's love. And we have to keep saying, God, raise my passion, raise my heart. Let me love people more. Even people that are hostile to me and hostile towards God, that's okay. God still loves them. And I want to love them too. God, raise my temperature. Is that growing in your life? The what? The time we spend with friends and family who need to know God's love. Do you actually make time in your schedule to be with people that don't know God's love? I know some Christians that kind of pull away from the world and it's like, well, I'm a Christian now. I want to hang around Christians and sing Christian songs and do Bible studies and spend all my time with Christians. And by the way, I like being with Christians. That's not my point. But, but how do you shine light when you're always tucked away with other Christians? So God, give me more time to be with people that need to know you love them too. The what? Our ability to tell our story and his story of salvation. How do I know I'm growing in spiritual maturity when it comes to organic outreach? Because I'm getting more comfortable telling my story. I can share with people, you know, this is what my life was like before. And I met Jesus and I, met, I experienced his love. I discovered that he washed all my wrongs away when he died on the cross and rose again. And he's kind of filled my life with joy and purpose and meaning. And I'm changed. I can tell my story about how God is moving in my life today. It's not some religious one hour a week church thing. I mean, God's moving in my life every day. I can tell those stories. Am I growing to become more natural in telling those stories? And then, can I tell his story? Can I tell the simple story of Jesus? I have been working for the last 40 years as a, as a Christian and then as a pastor trying to say, what's the simplest way I can help people to where they can say, I can tell the story of Jesus. I can do this. Because Christians are so nervous about it. What's the simplest way? I've come down to eight words. This is the easiest thing. Now, I give, you, you got a bookmark, so they're written down for you. Pull out your bookmark. It says go-go on the front, G-O-G-O. -O. This is a little reminder of how to tell the story of Jesus. And if you can remember these eight words, you can tell the story of Jesus. And, and this is just to put in your, in, in, your, in your Bible or put it somewhere where you're going to see it and it'll remind you. And it's just G-O-G-O. -G -O. It's eight words, two words, and there's four kind of movements. So here's how it goes. The first, look at the first two, God's love. When you're going to talk about Jesus and somebody wants to know about your faith and what you believe, say it all begins with God's love. For God so loved the world. While we were still messed up and sinful, Jesus died for us. It all starts with God. So, it's just, so the ball's kind of in God's court. God's love is first. Then the ball kind of comes over to our side. And he goes from G to R. Our problem. We have a problem. Here's the problem. Everybody look up here. Here's the problem. Here's, here's God. Here's us. And when we sin, when we think things we shouldn't think, say things we shouldn't say, do things we shouldn't do, that sin gets between. It's just this big glob of messy stuff between us, and we can't get to God because there's all this sin here. That's our problem. It's called sin. And that keeps us separate from God. So it's back to God. He's, God gives a solution. God's solution. So you got God's love, our problem, God's solution. God's solution was Jesus. God came from heaven, dealt with all this mess. He dealt with sin. When Jesus died on the cross, he took all the sin on himself. He took the punishment, he took the judgment, and he said, it's finished, it's gone. That's amazing. He died on the cross, he rose again, and he offers us forgiveness. It starts with God's love. Our problem is sin. God's solution is Jesus. Our response that's the, the last two words, our response. We, we confess, we say we're sorry for our sins, we turn away from them. We acknowledge Jesus as the one who paid the price, who God who came to pay the price, and we take the hand of Jesus and follow him for the rest of our lives. He becomes the leader of our life. That's our response. Some of you right now are going, I remember it already. 
You can go, okay, G-O-G-O. God's love, our problem, God's solution, our response. You can tell the whole story of Jesus with those eight words. So now you're trained. <laughs> but think about that and, just, and be ready to share that story. The what? The number of people we share with. I think we can actually ask the question, you know, how often am I talking about my faith with people? I'll give you an example. If you say, okay, in the last 12 months, I've actually had a conversation about my faith and what do I believe in my love for Jesus. It, let me add it up zero times in the last year then probably you're not praying and thinking about it very often because there's opportunities there. On a daily, weekly basis, there's opportunities. If you're just kind of aware. If you say, well, you know, I've, you know 10 times, 15, 20, in a growing measure to say, this is so important to me. Just start counting how often you talk about a show you like, a team you like, a restaurant you like, compared to the Lord that you like. Love, who's changed your life. Say, Lord, where, where does the, how do those other things come up in conversation? Just naturally. How does Jesus come up? It doesn't have to be weird. And we'll keep thinking about that. We'll keep talking about that. Now, in John chapter 3 and 4, and I'm not going to look at the passages, but in John chapter 3 and 4, in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, so the fourth of the Gospels, in John chapter 3 and 4, there's these two encounters that Jesus has, one with a guy named Nicodemus and one with a woman at a well. What's beautiful about those two chapters is right next to each other, there's these radically different experiences that are exactly the same. They're different because of the person. They're the same because of what Jesus is encountering. In the first story, Nicodemus, he's a man, he's powerful, he's a religious leader, he is wealthy, he's influential. And in, in the John 4, the woman at the well, she is poor, she is outcast, she is marginalized, she's Samaritan, which is kind of a half-breed in her day, a total outcast, rejected by people. And Jesus loves them both. And Jesus reaches out to them both and shares his love with both of them. He tells Nicodemus, you need to be born again, you need a new life. He tells the woman, the Messiah you're waiting for, Jesus says, it's me. <laughs> In this picture that Jesus reaches out to, here's the point, everybody at any time in any way. And he wants us ready, just available and ready to share our love for him in those moments. So the where and the when. What does this look like? What are ways that ordinary Christians can raise their outreach temperature and behavior, just to be involved a little bit more, living out this and growing in this marker of spiritual growth that will shine the light of Jesus in natural ways. And I'm just gonna rapid fire again. These are all on the website, but get trained, get equipped. And I'll say more about that in a minute. When there's an opportunity at Shoreline to do some training around outreach, jump into it, and it'll help prepare you and mature you in these, in these things. Next, read a helpful book. Read a good book about how do you personally share your faith in natural ways. I wrote a book a few years ago called Organic Outreach for Ordinary People. We sell it to the church here. I don't get any cut of the action. I don't get money off the sales of these books. Um, but if we sell them here at the church. But I would encourage you, if you say, I want to learn to naturally share my faith, pick up a copy of that book and start reading it. Because it'll, I gave it to a college student who said to me, I can't do outreach. I'm not an evangelist guy. I don't do that at all. I gave him this book. He read it. He said, well, I can do all that stuff. He's like, I do all that. I just can't do evangelism. I said, well, that is. The, the point is, you don't want to be, ob he's thinking about this obnoxious, pushy, in-your-face, antagonistic thing. And I said, that that's what, isn't what you should be doing anyways. But there's all kinds of natural ways to share your faith. Study, learn, take it seriously. Spend time with people who are far from Jesus. Make sure you have schedule, uh, you schedule time that you're not so busy doing churchy, Jesus-y stuff that you can't spend time with people that don't yet know God's love. Read the story of Jesus again and again and again and pay attention. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in the Gospels, in, in, in the New Testament, first four books in the New Testament, it's the story of Jesus' life. Read it slowly and thoughtfully and watch Jesus. Watch how he loved people. Watch how he just talked about the things of heaven. I think people in our world are longing for more than what they have in many, many cases and we can share it if we look for those opportunities, if we learn to share in natural ways. And then pray for and with people who don't yet have a relationship with Jesus. Pray for people regularly that don't know God's love. And even pray with people. I can tell you standing here today that, that since I've been a Christian, I have not, not kept track of numbers, but more than, more than a, probably more than a thousand times, I have talked with a non-Christian, somebody that clearly does not believe, an atheist, agnostic, non-religious, non-Christian person, over a thousand times, talking, having a conversation, and then the end of the conversation, I've said, would it be okay if I just said a prayer for you? You shared a deep pain or an incredible joy, or could I share, I've only had two people 
in all that time, over 1,000 people that have said no. And they didn't punch me or run away screaming. They just said, no, thanks. <laughs> but 998 or more have said, I'd like that. And after I pray for them, almost always the person says something like this. Thank you, that was really nice. Or, this is weird, I feel like tingly and stuff. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's, that's God's here. But it, it's, pray with people, pray for people. And then the how, a couple of very practical things. Practical next steps for you to take as you seek to share the message and shine the light of Jesus. What's your next step? What do you do next? Well, here's one. Come to Shoreline's training opportunities. When we do an opportunity, come to it. So May 19th, on a Saturday, we've got our next organic outreach conference event. It's a one-day Saturday. It's only $40 for one day. And we have Joshua Ryan Butler coming. Joshua Ryan Butler is an amazing communicator, a great writer. He's been here before. He's got an incredible heart for God. And we're going to look at, now listen to this, we're going to look at how we share faith and the love of Jesus in the most challenging and painful of places in the world where there's injustice and brokenness. We're going to talk about bringing the light of Jesus where there's human trafficking and lives being sold like, like property. We're going to talk about how do you bring the love of Jesus where there's poverty and brokenness. How do you bring the love of Jesus where people are forgotten and marginalized? That's where Jesus went. Jesus went to the, to the wealthy and he went to the poor. He went to the in crowd and the out crowd. So I want to challenge you today, at the end of the service, go by the, the, the booth over here by the Connections Cafe and just say, I want to get signed up. And as we do with all of our conferences, if you can't afford to be there, sign up, we'll figure it out. We want everyone to be there to be trained and equipped. So get trained, use those opportunities to be prepared to share your faith in natural ways. Practice telling your story. Actually think through, what's my story? How did God change my life? How is God changing my life? And talk with, if, talk with other Christians. Say, can I tell you about my story? about how I became a Christian, and just actually, listen to this, open your mouth and talk about Jesus. Do it with a Christian first. If you can't talk with Jesus with a Christian, then you're, okay, you gotta be able to talk to Jesus with a Christian. <laughs> you know, just do the, practice that, and get used to talking about your faith, and then God will open a door for you to talk about your faith with someone that doesn't know Jesus. Practice telling his story. Take the gospel go-go thing, and just practice it out loud. I can share the whole story of Jesus in probably about two or three minutes, just using this outline, and I've done it many, many times. Practice telling his story. Impact prayer names. Come up with two or three or four names of people that you love that don't yet know Jesus. Put them in your phone with a daily alarm or reminder. Put them on a little post-it note on your mirror in your bathroom so when you're brushing your teeth, you can pray for them. Put it on your refrigerator. Put it somewhere you're gonna see it and pray for those people because there's power in prayer. And then dare to ask spiritual questions. Dare to actually, in the middle of a conversation, actually look at somebody and say something like, you know, what's your... What's your Religious background. What's your, been your religious experience? What's your church background? So what if they say, I don't have any? Well, then you learn something about them. That's what I told people when they asked me before, before I was a Christian. I didn't grow up in the church. It didn't freak me out. It's just, oh, no, I don't do that. That's not my thing. Oh. But, but ask people. You'd be amazed at how many people will talk with you about their spiritual journey. And now in our world today, more and more, as I travel to different parts of the world and as I'm even here, some people are so, they're so disconnected with the idea of Christianity, they're not hostile to Christianity they just don't even think about it. So I'll talk about faith, and other people say, like, that's really interesting. People actually believe that? Like, yeah, lots of them through all the history of the world. But people don't even, they're like, oh, that's a new thing. That's a new thought to me. And that may seem strange to you, but I mean, I didn't grow up in the church. This was all new to me. And I grew up right here in America, right? I knew nothing about Jesus. I didn't know Christmas and, I didn't know Christmas and Easter were religious holidays until I became a Christian. So there's people that don't have any reference point. They're not offended by Christianity. They just don't know anything about it. And so have those conversations. Talk about spiritual things. Peter, one of Jesus' followers, um, in Acts chapter 2, preaches this amazing sermon about Jesus. But a short time before that, Peter, this is the Peter who denied Jesus three times. This is the Peter who, when Jesus was arrested and they were going to take him to the cross, somebody came to Peter and said, hey, aren't you one of Jesus's, you know, Buddies, aren't you one of Jesus' you know, disciples, the guys that hang out with him? And Peter goes, no, I don't know what you're talking about. No, no. A little bit later, somebody else comes to him and says, no, wait a minute, no. You're one of those disciple guys. You're one of them. And Peter says, I swear I don't know the man. That's what it says. A little bit later, someone comes and says, you got, you got a Galilean accent. You are, you're one of them. You're one of those disciples. And the third time, here's what Peter says. I swear I don't know the man. May I be cursed if I know Jesus? I don't know him. That Peter, okay? 
Three times he denies Jesus. By the way, Jesus was right there and heard it all. Because it says Jesus turned and looked at Peter. I don't think with hatred, I think with sadness. Like, Peter, really, you know. But that Peter, a few days later, Christ is risen, Easter's come. And the Holy Spirit's been unleashed on the church. And in Acts chapter two, I love this. Verse 14 of Acts two says, then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. You'll notice I jumped from verse 14 to verse 40. There's a whole sermon in the middle there. I'm not gonna read it all. But here's this Peter who was shy and reserved and, and afraid and he's now bold and he's talking about Jesus. It can happen for him as the Holy Spirit worked in him. It can happen in you and me to where we can naturally talk about our faith in Jesus. So finally, the who. Who you will become and the joy you will find who you'll become and the joy you will find as you grow in organic outreach. When you naturally learn to share your faith, what's gonna happen in you? Here's some things. You will feel the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life like never before. When you naturally talk about your faith, you're gonna feel the Holy Spirit of God fill you and overflow to other people. You're gonna go, man, this is incredible. God is here. God is with me. You will see God use you in his saving work in the lives of people you care about. When I saw my brother Jason say yes to Jesus after almost 20 years of praying for him and walking with him and sharing with him. Natural, organic conversation. Man, that was amazing. When you see someone say yes to Jesus and their whole life changes, there's nothing like it. Who will you become? You will see the power of Jesus over darkness, lies, and the dark world of the enemy of our souls. When you see God break into lives and change people, there's nothing like it. You, when you get to see that, you're like, man, I want to be more a part of sharing God's love in natural ways. When you say broken people become whole and their lives restored, you'll be amazed. When you see people that live in, in, just in sadness and desperation be filled with joy, you'll be amazed at what God does. When you see people that are wandering far from God find purpose and direction in their life, You'll say, man, this is incredible. This is amazing. You'll have new family. I remember the day that my sister became my sister. My older sister was always my sister by blood, by family. But when she became a Christian, she became my sister forever in Jesus. That was life-changing for her, but it was life-changing for me. It was amazing. And you will hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. I believe that God is just waiting for us not to be obnoxious and not to be buggy and not to be overbearing, but organically, naturally, just as excited as we are about our favorite restaurant, our favorite sports team, our favorite store, we have a God who loves us. We can share that story naturally.